Um, you want to stand here? I'm right. going to probably go stand over there okay. and just look at it from here over here. Okay. Is everybody rolling? That's going. That's going. That's going. That's going. Don't be intimidated by the camera. Not at all. <laughs> just by so intimidating. Yeah, yeah, they're all leaving. And guys, make sure your phones are off or on vibrate. Yeah, my cell phone's off, and I don't think anybody's going to be... No. And there's that. Good timing. Yeah. Go, ahead, go ahead and answer the phone. That's the other one, yeah. <laughs> Hello? Hi, honey. Don't call this number again, you hear? <laughs> How you doing, sweetheart? Okay, we have some people there doing a, a filming of your mother here, so... You know, <laughs> Uh, all right, I love you, sweetheart. Okay, bye. No any. Well, that worked out pretty well. That's interestingly enough. Anyway, uh, I guess what they really they, they always say to start to begin at the beginning, and so the uh, first question that anybody really wanted to know is how you got started in the business, and I was always fascinated by the story you told about how your father knew was it the grandfather of grandfather of Will Eisner? Yeah. And this is how you met your first professional cartoonist? Right. First one. Right. My grandfather knew his father, knew Will Eisen's father. We knew each other very well. And uh, so that was good. So you got an appointment to go up to see Will Eisner? Yeah, yeah I made an appointment, went to his, uh, his office in New York, and uh, we had a nice talk. And he was very, very nice to me. Wasn't this something that's very interesting? You walked in and you saw this beautiful artwork of Will Eisner's. Ah, How intimidating yeah. that must have been. Yeah, they had, he had these high ceilings, and they were filled with his work. And I walked in, and I looked around, and I thought to myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell am I to be sitting here? And you were, what, 17 at the time, 18 yeah. years old? Yeah. Well, he was considered to be the real father of... Um, you know, continuity and, and sequential art. He uh, had put out several books, and yes. uh, he was always considered to be the master of that. Yeah, and that storytelling. Yeah. yeah, but you did get a job out of it. You did get a recommendation to uh, uh, Bert Whitman at uh, Debbie Dean. You right. started out right. uh, working as a professional. Yeah, because he was looking for an artist to help him. Which, of course, uh, after Debbie Dean and uh, moving on to. Uh, Marvel to um, DC Comics and doing national comics, mm -hmm. and uh, that again, again, sequential art and seeing how comics are done. Mm -hmm. You worked with and saw some of the great arts, oh, you sure. know, Al Toth and, yeah. and uh, Joe Kubert. Right, and, right. My God, there, it must have been a, just a, a, an education to see oh, all yeah. this artwork coming across the desk. And I, my job was to correct their work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that takes a certain amount of courage to uh, touch someone else's artwork. Yeah. And the DC Comics, you were you were at National for three years before you went freelance. Yes, yes. Uh, that was my first real job, and uh, I was there for three years. Mm -hmm. Met all the um, editors up there, and they all promised to give me work when I left, and that's the way it worked out. So it was three years, and then you went full-time freelance, and you had, I assume you worked not just for National, but also for Marvel, you know, at the time, Timely right. Comics. Yes. Then Stan Lee, so you did uh, work for that company yes. as well. Yes, yeah. And so yes. freelance was uh, pretty much your, yeah, that was it. That was pretty much the last full-time staff job. That's what I strived for, to be freelance, you know, and work for as many different people as I could. And... Uh, but uh, they were nice to me because they sent me off with a lot of work. <laughs> but you didn't get into color really until time. Right? No, I was so frightened of color because I never did color. I never even owned crayons when I was a kid. <laughs> so, you know, when it came to color, I was... And one of my first assignments was to do a time color with color. Mm -hmm. And boy, I was scared. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, but it worked out, and then I had Frazetta, Frank Frazetta. Uh, I had to do a movie, and I called him and asked him for his help, guidance. And uh, I went over to his place, and uh, I showed him my art, and he told me what I should do, and that was a big help to me.
because I knew nothing about color. But you do such beautiful color now. You you obviously got comfortable enough where you've experimented. First, I remember you had inks and and then yeah. you had solid watercolors and you tried different things and the work that you've done with Mad and others. When beautiful. you find out that you're learning something and you get more comfortable with what you've learned and you go further and further and then you get the whole picture of what you have to do to do a good color assignment. And uh, color was, uh, I remember saying to Nick Meglin because I had a job to do and I said, I can't do color, Nick, you gotta do it for me. He said, well, I'll do this one. But yeah. after this, you're on your own. <laughs> and so it was, uh, it was scary to do color for me because I had no background for it and no natural ability for it. Uh, I was a black and white person my whole career. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's coming from the comics and yeah. from Mad itself. Mad was always, of course, black yeah, and white. And right. In fact, in the days when Al Feldstein was um, keeping the magazine pretty much in straight line. There was really no halftone for mm -hmm. a long time. It was only right. until the 60s that they started to, I guess, improve reproduction techniques yes. so that you can add wash and, yeah. and pencil to and your And you had work. to have the uh, good paper to do it on, you know. Yeah, you had the craft in before yeah. the smelly. Oh, <laughs> I hated that craft in. You did? The smell from the chemicals was enough to die from. <laughs> But, well, they uh, did have a kind of rotten egg yeah, smell. I do remember yeah. using them in the early part, when, in the days when they actually manufactured it. It was craft tint, and then it became duo shade when the company Graphics bought it. And it still had that awful yeah. chemical. I remember working with Joe Simon, uh, and he said, you don't even need the chemicals. These were like developing chemicals. Mm -hmm. He had um, you know, for the stat camera, these mm -hmm. horrible chemicals. Mm -hmm. He says, this is all you need for the light and the dark, and everything just smelled. Oh, yeah. It was terrible. It was a horrible uh, uh, yeah. tool, but... Long, I'm sure be, will be missed somewhere along, along the line. Yeah. But it was interesting because when you talk about color, one of the things that I am even admiring your work, somebody like myself and others would look at an artist and say, I love the way he does color. But you're saying the same thing that I had to learn in having these conversations with you, is that when you have the confidence, you start to do your own color. You don't want to paint like someone else. You want to paint like yourself. And it takes a while to kind of find yourself and feel comfortable. To have the confidence and to uh, know what you're doing, yeah. And it's experimenting. It's all experimentation. Uh, everything is experimentation. Uh, even, you know, drawing and learning how to tell a story. It's, it's all, and that's the fun of it all. Once you get a handle on what a good artist is supposed to be and do, mm -hmm. and then you get that confidence it, it's it's good. It's good to when you. Yeah, because it rings up the question and confidence is that you your influences of course were Al Dorn and Hal Foster. All the great ones. All the great ones, and, and Robert Fawcett, mm -hmm. and yet amalgamating all of those different influences to come up with your own. Your style is unique, and so when somebody looks at your work, they can say that's a Mort Drucker. They know exactly your style. Yeah. And if somebody imitates you, they say that's a ripoff of what. <laughs> that's how much your style is, yeah. is noticed, yeah. and that's what I, I. What people want to know is how do you find your style and how do you find well, yourself. Well, you know, uh, everybody wants to know how you do. What's your style is? I never was concerned with style. I never thought about it. That came naturally when you got to know what you were doing. Mm -hmm. I never thought about style, and. Uh, so, you know, I, uh, I never copied any artist. I was influenced by a lot of good artists, mm -hmm. learned from them. But I knew I could not set out copying anybody. That's not the way to go. You learn from what, you see what they do and, and, you, and it clicks in your head that, that that's perfect. Mm -hmm. So then you learn how to handle that, you know. And uh, so, if you copy somebody, then you gotta unlearn that you what you're copying, and you gotta become yourself. So I decided I want to be myself, good or bad. I'll do what I think is good for me, and uh, that's the way it worked out. That seems to be the real essence of creativity, because as I was saying, you know, Sam Viviano, wonderful artist, a great guy, and he and I were talking, and he said, you know, Mort Drucker can do Steven Spielberg, I can do Steven Spielberg. Steve Brodner can do Steven Spielberg and all the other artists, and everybody's looking at the same 
guy, mm -hmm. the same detail, the same reference material, the same photograph, whatever it is, and it's always different. Right. And it's fascinating to think about it that like that like it's a raw shock test. Everybody's looking at the same ink blot, and it's a totally different interpretation. Right. I always said you can take. Uh, several different caricaturists and put them in different rooms to do the same person and we'll come back and do it differently but it looks like that person you know? and that's why it's your style that's why you know when they say it's this looks like a more trucker it's more trucker mm. so i've always thought as much as i would love and, and traced your work and, and copied it it was to understand why you did what you did mm -hmm. and yet it's yourself you can't be the other person no. and so when you do the caricature it has to be one's own interpretation no matter whether you like it or not yeah because if you don't become yourself and you're doing other people there's going to come a time when those people are not going to be around you're not mm -hmm. going to be able to learn from them anymore and then you're left out in the cold mm -hmm. you've got to know that you have to be yourself and you don't copy, but you learn from what you see. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that's what it's all about. You, you, people ask me, how'd you get your style? I never thought about style, never gave it a thought. Mm -hmm. I did what I did, and it's, the style develops. And I tell young people, when they ask me the same question, they say, don't think about style, don't worry about it, just be yourself, that'll mm -hmm. come later. And also, I, I was very interested in learning folds mm -hmm. and learning hands because those two things I remember when I was young were difficult for a lot of professional artists mm -hmm. because I knew a lot of professional artists and they would hide hands in pockets and mm -hmm. behind their back they never really wanted to get involved with hands and also with wrinkles I would be in the subway and I'd watch people standing up mm -hmm. and holding on to the thing and it was wonderful to know why, where the pull is coming from, why the wrinkles are with there. You just don't slap in wrinkles like a lot of people did because they didn't want to understand the, 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 the reason for it. Mm -hmm. And I felt that if you understand the reason for anything, it will be better. And I always thought that if anything was difficult, don't shy away from it. Mm -hmm. Attack it. Go after it and learn why it's difficult and learn how to do it and then you're home free. You don't have to worry about the difficulties of hands or caricature faces and things like that. And when it comes to caricature, I was always interested in the body language besides the face. There is a body language that all these people have. And I always point out Cary Grant because mm -hmm. uh, you could be behind him and <laughs> The way he stands, he's like leaning. Mm -hmm. and he's got that white color above the jacket. There are, there are things that each one has that separates them from mm -hmm. the other person. Mm -hmm. And uh, body language to me is, is as important as getting the, the face. And I remember Nick Megaling telling me I've done people from the back and you knew who they were without even, you know, no, knowing about it. If you're only going to do heads, that's one thing. But if you're going to, do a, like what I was doing, I was doing uh, movie takeoffs and mm -hmm. each panel was different and, and so forth and you had to know how to be, to vary the characters you were doing. And uh, so that's what you, you looked for, you know. How can you uh, do a Cary Grant or anybody else from the back, looking down, looking up, you mm -hmm. know. So, and when they smile or they laugh and things like that, so you try to learn what makes the face do what it does, the muscle structure and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that's when you start to develop and know what you're doing and that's how you become better at what you're doing. Uh, so those are things you look for to become a full-fledged artist. You don't hide anything. Get to know all the facts about the body, the wrinkles, uh, the expression. You know, because if you want to be good at what you do, you got to know all that. What's fascinating about that is when you talk about the different elements, it's bringing it together. You talked about folds. You talked about the uh, body language, and you talked about the the likeness in the face. And 
what people find fascinating about your work is that you master each of those areas to amalgamate them that into a final product because most people would say well I'm working on hands now I have to work on body language <laughs> now I have to work on and continuity and yeah. said I have to make that look like the same person page after page after page mm -hmm. well working for mad uh, I realized that what I do is like being a, a movie director mm -hmm. and and you learn what makes a good movie director you learn you know to vary your your panel from panel to panel to get in close do long shots to make a page look interesting how you use your blacks mm -hmm. you know things like that and I find that varying your distances and stuff like that looking up looking down those are what directors do in the movies and uh, you are a director when you're doing a, a, a movie satire that's very funny because the, the directors that have gone on to become famous and, and uh, notable have all given you credit for that. You know, Steven Spielberg, of course, has uh, learned a lot about directing, watching your pages in Mad. You know, J.J. Abrams, even the guys who uh, did Airplane, you know, the Zucker, Abrams, Zucker, they all said the idea of a Mad panel and that you have little gags in the background is what they do in their films. Mm -hmm. And all of them give you credit for having inspired them for that is that they became directors learning from you, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the idea of, uh, you know, the, what they used to call the chicken fat, filling the panel with so many different gags and, and little touches that mm. just make it, that you can revisit it again and again and again. Yeah, I, I also had to be careful when I was throwing in side gags or mm -hmm. ex, you know, expressions or attitudes. I didn't want to step on the writer's area. You know, mm -hmm. so my, my stuff was less important. But this is the thing about art that I found fascinating. And when I first came here and asked for advice, it's kind of daunting is that you have all these unlimited choices and you decide when you read a script from Mad how far to take it, how to enhance it. You're not there to compete against the writer. You're there to make it better. Exactly. What I learned from you in that is that you must ask your question, what's the goal? The goal was to make people laugh to the best of your ability with Mad. It wasn't to showcase your work. In the same way that when you do advertising, it's to sell the product. Right. If you do a magazine cover, it's to sell the magazine. Right. If you do an editorial, it's to get people to read the article. So the art is really a means to an end, is that it's not the final product. It's right. part of the process of getting to some other goal. And within all of that framework, the next problem has always been professionalism, meeting deadlines, understanding their concerns. I used to go into job interviews in what, my portfolio and I was the only one wearing a suit. And I could see the art director, I had the, you can comment on this, I had one art director tell me an interesting story. Somebody had come in with his portfolio but he was atrociously dressed. And he said, uh, you know, guys, you think you could, you know, get more appropriately uh, attired for this? And he says, well, my work speaks for itself. He says, the work speaks for the artwork. I don't know how long it took you to do this. I don't know if it's going to be months for you to finish this assignment, if the muse is going to hit you. He said, everything, everything, including your demeanor and the way that you dress, tells me that the artwork does not speak for itself because mm -hmm. the artwork doesn't tell me anything about your professionalism. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether or not you're going to meet your deadline. And I've had a lot of art directors say, some guys just would call and say, I, I couldn't get it done. Uh, the mood wasn't there. <laughs> It's okay, and they never got hired again. So I was on the kind of on the short list for people who, you know, when somebody bailed out of a job, I would get called and I'd get something done immediately. Well, I, when I met you, I learned immediately that you were the kind of person who was dependable. Not only talented, but you knew that you had to be there, you had to deliver, and there was no excuse for poor work, you had all the attributes of a real professional. And I, I knew that right away. And it's been years since we know each other and you never, you never missed, never missed. Not one deadline, I learned that from you because no matter how much, I was there one time you're doing a mad story and you were over at the desk cutting amber lith, waiting, and the, and the FedEx guy was on his way, you hadn't even packed it, and said, everything just has to be just right. Mm -hmm before you sign it and send it out and put it in the package. And I thought, 
if there's any lesson that anyone should ever learn is that it's always you can improve and you you must make sure that you can't just put it in an envelope mm. i'm always surprised that when i look at artwork sometimes and i say you know there's there's more that can be done you know there's a lot more to learn you've never stopped experimenting you've I've seen you try different tools all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I, you're looking for different pens, anything that would make the job more exciting and interesting. You never looked for the shortcut. Yeah. All of life is a learning experience. And, and everything you learn, you have all that much material to put into your work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because now the, the computer is so ubiquitous. Everybody has to have a computer. Any illustrator is obviously going to have a computer of some kind or another, even if it's just to send and receive emails and send artwork on scanners. And, but it's changed so remarkably, the mm -hmm. marketplace. You've never used technology. Everything you've ever done has been by hand. You dip your pen in an inkwell. You didn't say, I want to use a felt tip marker to cut time. You never did the shortcuts and you never tried to find a way of, of making the, the job just easier for yourself. Mm -hmm. You always challenged yourself to do whatever, however hard it was, mm. to think that a nine page satire like The Godfather that you did for Mad, nine pages of beautiful, intricate artwork has to be almost backbreaking in the time of computers when things can be done so quickly with all sorts of technology. Yeah, but when you like your work, you don't think that way. Because whatever you do, you're enjoying it, you know. Um. <laughs> Isn't that something, from the times that we've gone to museums and, and, and the vacations and trips and looking at all the exciting art, like the time we went to see the Sargent paintings and, and noticing that, you know, the preliminary sketches and the, the thought processes and putting all of these, these pieces together, is that there's an essence. We stand in front of paintings or artwork or, or an illustration and we're moved by it, while other times we see things and it doesn't, you turn the page and it doesn't really have an effect on us. But for those people that have an ability to do something, whether it's a comic strip, it's um, an artwork, illustration, painting, it's trying to find what it is, that, that essence of something that just moves people, that I think people seek that out. It's mm -hmm. why they try and find authors that you know wrote books that they loved, and they just want to get some idea of how it is that you've captured something in this drawing and then do it again and again and again. It's, it's a fascinating and elusive thing that I've always found captivating. What I observed with some artists that I love so much is that when they do a scene or they do people and costumes, they, they know what to leave out. I remember one artist who I admired very much, and he was doing <clears throat> a costume, and he had a dagger in a holster, mm -hmm. and he knew just what, when to stop. And I looked at it, and I said to myself, he could have done so much more, elaborated it on, mm -hmm. but then it would be overdone. He knew when to stop, and he made it look great, you know. You've controlled the flow of the eye and what is important by how much you emphasize a black against white, how you subjugate it by softening the tone. So you're in control of where the audience is supposed to pay attention. You don't put so much detail as you say with the dagger in the background. Is that knowing when to stop means the dagger wasn't the focus of the painting. It was an element of the painting, mm -hmm. but it wasn't necessary enough to articulate it to the extent that you want people to notice it. Mm -hmm. But it's subtle enough that you know it's there, mm -hmm. it serves its purpose. So that is a very challenging thing for the artist to say, okay, here's where I want the attention, then this is not important, but I want it there. So it's a real sense of learning how to control the drawing. And that's when I, I learned from other artists, the good ones, is when not to overdo. I think all of art is observation. So that's what I, you know, I look for. I look for all the elements that would help to make a good picture. When you say observation, you also have, from your, your prism of, of perspective, is that everything comes through with a humorous. You look for the humor yes. in things. 
you're specifically saying, here's what you see, but you give it your own unique twist to it so that it's delightful. And even years ago when I was visiting and you said you had done uh, caricatures of politicians, and the idea is you don't want to be cruel. No. You don't want to intentionally make someone look hideous and take a political point of view and say, this person is not my kind of guy and I'm just going to insult him. You always kept things very You want to be honest. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you take a Barbara Streisand who has a, a nose. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't want to make that nose the thing that you're attracted to. Mm -hmm. That's part of her face. That's just a part of it. Don't embellish things that make a person look ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to like the people you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you want to be honest to them, true to them. Uh, even if it's someone, a politician who you don't like, and there are several who I don't like, <laughs> I'm not going to uh, poison my pen mm -hmm. because I don't like them. You know? I try to be honest. And... Uh, I find that's the way to be. And if you have a, a humorous bent to what you want to do, then use the humor. Use the humor. As long as it doesn't overshadow anything mm -hmm. else. Some people, you know, humor is not important to them. They're artists, they're professionals, and they do their job. But wherever I can inject some humor in my drawing, I try to do it because it makes me feel good. Uh, when Nick Beglin had done his book, The Art of Humorous Illustration, there were a whole variety of artists. There was Norman Rockwell, who did somewhat realistic portraits, but humorously. Oh, yeah. And then you go to the other extreme. You had Jack Davis, who's a wonderful caricaturist uh, illustrator who does very exaggerated, almost animated uh, mm. kinds of illustrations. It runs the gamut. Sure it does, yeah. And it does that because every artist is different, and he looks for different things. Mm -hmm. And his ability is different, so uh, that's. What and you've is. decided when doing your drawing, it's not it's not too Rockwell and it's not too uh, Jack David. You know, you really have something unique, and that's I think. Well, because I don't want to be those people. I want to learn from them. Mm -hmm. but I don't want to be those people. I want to be me. Be honest with myself, mm -hmm. and everything I do is coming out of my own my own head, mm -hmm. because. Uh, that's what art is all about. That's the illustrator who's doing it. So you've seen all of these guys. You've, you've been uh, a lover of Rockwell. You've been a lover of, oh, of all the other sure. illustrators. How can you not be? You know? <laughs> How can you not be? It's yeah. just, it was, it was some guys, he, he just never felt that he was you know, like an artist. He was more uh, considered an illustrator. And that never bothered you in the sense of um, the what you do, how you're categorized. Is that... No. It just matters to do good work. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't want people to put me in a box and say, this is what I do, who I am. Uh, this is my, work, my kind of work. I want to do different kind of work. You mm -hmm. know? I don't want to do just one kind of thing. So I don't want to be thought of as a one, one method artist. Mm -hmm. When you did caricature, when you did a drawing of a face, you made it look natural. It didn't look like a head had been placed on a body. It yeah, the lollipop looked... head, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I always try to do things in their proportions. You know? Uh, you know, even if you're doing a head uh, and a body, you try to keep them pretty close to the way they should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's so much to look for, and there's so much that makes one artist different from another. And I think this is all observation. Every artist has his own ability to observe, and that makes them different. Mm -hmm. Some people, some artists could be in a train, mm -hmm. and they'll see someone sitting across, and the way their coat falls off their lap, or mm -hmm. the way they reach for the uh, strap. Uh, and the different fabrics and, and that's right. lighting. Yeah, yeah, fabrics are different. You do a shirt, it's thin. You have different creases. You do a coat, it's thick, and it has other creases. 
That's what you have to observe in what you do. You want a coat to look like a coat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I like the idea of not doing things in a minimalist form because if you're really, as they say, if you're adding the verisimilitude of it, is to look and say, this guy is in, in the winter. And so you had told me and showed me is that if a guy's covering his coat and he's pulling, he's, you know, he's freezing, you can convey through the body language that's, right. that's taking place. But you have to be able to know how to manipulate the body and move it so that it looks natural. Mm -hmm. And that requires sketching and mm -hmm. drawing and knowing anatomy and then right. making it look real by knowing the lighting and how light falls on, on three-dimensional objects and giving mm -hmm. it that you know, modeling effect. All of that may seem daunting in its complexity, but that's the challenge. You've always been thrilled to continue to learn, learning. To learn, you never yeah. got that sense of, oh, God, more work to be done. It was always fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because it makes you better. It makes you better, and you enjoy it, you know. Uh, I remember one time we had a, a one-room apartment in the basement. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we had to go through the boiler room to get to our one big room. Mm -hmm. We had a kitchen in the wall, and one day I'm in the train, I'm wearing a, a light gray top coat. Mm -hmm. And because of where I hung it, I looked down, and since it's a light gray coat, little tiny ants <laughs> all over the coat. <laughs> I was not, never knew it. They were I living in the, in the, uh, in the boiler basement. room. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, that brings up another very interesting and important uh, uh, issue, is that you and Barbara, this one uh, coming in uh, August, and is going to be 67, uh, 66 years that you've been married. Yeah. So that'll be 70 years together. Mm -hmm. 70 years. And she uh, loves to tell the story how you two met in the, uh, in the luncheonette. Yeah. Going back to Brooklyn. Yeah. We, uh, we used to see each other in the halls. And I never knew her name. And we'd say, hi, Blondie. And she'd say, hi, Mort. <laughs> and uh, one time we had lunch together and we got to really know each other. And, we, yeah. and uh, that was the best time of my life, getting to know Barbara and getting to know a person who I fell in love with. She was everything to me. Mm -hmm. She is so much. And you know, too, I never had too much confidence in myself, never. She was the one that was the first to give me confidence in myself, confidence in my work, confidence in what I talked about, because I didn't have, I was, there was no me. I tried to be everybody who I admired. So I never had my own personality. But because of her, I learned to have my own personality. Because I learned that I could learn from other people, you know, a little bit of this and that. She was very important in my life to become a person, the person I became. Mm -hmm. Without her, I don't know what I would have been. Extraordinary. And, it's, um, and you have two wonderful daughters and uh, wonderful uh, grandchildren. Fantastic. It's been pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing, pretty extraordinary. Yeah. <clears throat> Before my work is shown to anybody, she's my editor. Mm -hmm. And she will tell me when, when things don't gel. And she'll be mm -hmm. honest. She'll be honest. Mm hmm uh, she may know that she's hurting my feelings because I did it. I, that's why I did it. <laughs> but she points out that it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then when I look at it, I agree. You know, it's, it's, it's good. What, the criticism is good. Uh, and she's never afraid to hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to have a good, strong uh, sounding board. Oh, yeah. Somebody to give you an honest appraisal, to challenge oh, yeah. you to do your best. Yeah. When she says it's good, Mm -hmm. I know it's good. I'll go with it. I must say that uh, going back maybe more than 40 years, when I first visited you, you had a, a wonderful green stuffed chair in the corner here. And now you've replaced it with this desk where Barbara works. Mm -hmm. And now I assume, and certainly when uh, I was lettering eventually and doing some other things, uh, Barbara started to get more and more involved in the business and was instrumental really in, in taking that burden off of you so that you can draw 
So how has that been like as having Barbara and you together in the office and handling pretty much the whole business? It's been wonderful. There's been no arguments, no, no problems. I mean, she takes care of things that I don't want to do. And, mm -hmm. uh, she's terrific. Uh, I couldn't ask for a better person to love mm -hmm. and to live with and to have children with. And I was 14 when I met her. Mm -hmm. But she gave me the confidence to be myself. And that's very important. Mm -hmm. So. And working here the, together like that has always been that kind of um, positive experience because certainly in the, uh, in the times that she was instrumental, I remember having uh, conversations with her at the time when she was working at the desk, had everything organized, knew where everything was. If there was ever a problem or a question, get into the uh, record, had everything at her fingertips. She knew where everything was handled mm -hmm. so that you didn't have to deal with dealing with the clients and talking mm -hmm. with the reps and all that, which is freeing to... Uh, she always used to buy me more time when I had, uh, you know, uh, a due date. Mm, really? <laughs> with her charm, she would be able to talk to the art director <laughs> and give me another day or so, you know. <laughs> uh, she knew all the people I worked with mm -hmm. and uh, they liked her, you know. They, she was a better part of me. And uh, if I'm talking to a person who is a, a young artist, a young person, uh, I try to tell them what it is that you have to to do, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, don't be satisfied with the pictures. If your mother and father say, oh, that's beautiful, be honest with yourself. You mm -hmm. know? And uh, because only when you're honest with yourself can you face the world, can mm -hmm. you face the competition. And you do say that when Barbara was critical and when you show her a portfolio and it's not perceived that this makes you a better person, a better artist, because you're, you're being challenged. No question. So you don't necessarily say, well, this is what I've done and take it and that's mm, just too it's bad. It's good enough. Yeah. It's good enough. Is that mm. it's, always, it's okay to be hurt a little bit from time to time. No question. Rejection. If you're not going to be... Um, hurt by someone who loves you mm -hmm. and you go off on the wrong track, you're going to be hurt by people who don't give a damn about you, you know what I'm saying? That's true. Well, it certainly shows everything has been extraordinary, influential, important, and it's just been a delight really to be able to talk to you and, and do this and leave this for the people who ever wanted some very valuable advice. I'm here to tell you that it's always what I've applied works. And this has been the best advice that has ever been given because it has certainly been the most valuable and the most applicable. Well, you were one of those rare young individuals who was smart enough to know he wanted to learn, always willing to learn. And, and, and you did that. That's why you became the, the, the artist you are today and the person you are. You know, I knew artists who were looking for people to help them. Mm -hmm. And to me, if I could give that artist a person that I would respect and, and feel happy to recommend, you would be the one. Because you were special, special. I appreciate that, and even more the fact that you used the word young. So... Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I'm, I'm deeply appreciative and, and best. And so I mean, here's the great opportunity to say, I love you, you're terrific, and this has been just the most extraordinary. Well, you know how much I love you, Barbara, life. and I love you very much. Well, this is, I want this on permanent record forever. This is, on, this is for all eternity. So thank you very much. Thank you.